Hello, welcome to Now in Color, the podcast that brings those who have been erased from history back to the forefront. I'm your host, Sandy Chang. If you listen to First Generation Burden, the amazing podcast honored by the Webby Awards, this episode may sound familiar to you. Rich Too has been recording the Stay Home edition of his podcast, and I was lucky enough to be one of his first virtual guests. We virtually recorded this episode back when quarantine first started in New York City around late March. So... If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and listen to First Generation Burden wherever you get podcasts. Without further ado, enjoy this episode. Hey, First Gen family. This is your host, Rich Too. This is a special series in this feed called First Gen Stay Home Edition. The mission is the same, sharing immigrant stories from the creative community, but in this new normal we're all experiencing. I'll be catching up with friends of the show as well as some new ones. Before we get to our guests, I encourage all of you to help support your frontline healthcare providers and donate to First Responders First, a fund dedicated to frontline healthcare providers serving during the coronavirus pandemic. And you can do that at Help dot first responders first dot co okay sandy chang rich too <laughs> welcome back uh sandy host of now in color uh thanks for joining us on this special series for first gen burden this is first gen stay home edition and you are technically the first one recording this so that's fun you're we're so both guinea pigging this yay it's so exciting i'm so glad to be back on first gen burden well, like guys we're happy edition. to have you back yeah, yeah. <laughs> stay home edition although we are talking about stay the home community. yes stay home edition good <laughs> there you go so i uh, just want to catch up also just talk about some issues but uh mainly how are you doing we haven't talked that much lately but yeah give me the lowdown i know when was the last i think the last time was i saw you in canal street market and i waved in a distance and i came yes. in for a second and then i left yes you had a nice little cameo in yeah. have an allowance episode of first gen it was a season finale yay yeah that was so cool um i recorded um i actually wanted to start recording there recently but then this thing happened this pandemic happened so didn't get a chance yeah well hopefully soon in the future yes hopefully yeah I, i'm feeling much more hopeful than i was uh, when this all started in March, it feels like it's been a year now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Like I'm, I'm still, you know, trying to work through my own feeling of normalcy and what normal means. Even today I was lying down on the floor for like 15, 20 minutes just to, to feel something physically different in my two bedroom apartment. <laughs> Yeah, that was me um, a couple weeks ago. Well, whenever this, it's been three or four weeks now, right? I don't know. Time does not exist anymore. Right. But basically, I also laid down on the floor and I started laughing hysterically. Now all your listeners are going to think I'm a crazy person. But it truly, I was just laughing hysterically and saying crazy things like time and money are not real. And then from the laughter came tears. And now I'm like, chill. I think I got it out of my system. And now I'm like, okay, this is what's happening. I've adjusted to it, hopefully. Yeah. So speaking of that, what's your, what's your life like now? How has your lifestyle changed now that we're in this uh, pandemic and in this uh, nationwide quarantine? Um, also, we are Zooming this right now, so the audio sounds a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, but it is good to actually see you uh, on camera. So I would love for our listeners to just get that bit. Uh, I think for me, the biggest change has been, uh, I consider myself more of, I guess, a social person, I guess, an extrovert. So the biggest change is obviously I cannot go out and just like go and explore the city and do the things that I want to do and meet people. I can't go and record my podcast episodes, but I guess I could do a Zoom. But I honestly did not have that... (laughs) I didn't have the emotional capacity to do this. So good job, Rich, for pulling through. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I was working remotely uh, even before this, and it wasn't that much of a difference. But I think the only change is everyone else is working remotely. 
and are really anxious about it. I think there's like a lack of trust or like they're, everyone's just like not used to working remotely basically. So there's like a lot of anxiety around it. I could feel the anxiety and like all of these zoom meetings. When this all started, I was averaging like five or seven zoom meetings a day. And that is not normal. I think everyone was just like eager for like some sort of human connection and like making sure we're all on the same page, even though technically you can do everything online in what I do, which is digital ads, (laughs) my survival (laughs) job. (laughs) Do you think that this is a pressure test, a pressure test to see exactly how much from your organization can work from home? I don't know. The only reason I ask that is because uh, I've been home working from home again for my survival job, been working from home for a month now. And it, the the switch flipped so quickly, um, obviously, because, you know, the, it, there was an acceleration event, right, right. Uh, when it came to the realization of the pandemic. But now it's just so normal. And I, I've been fortunate enough where we do have this, this spare bedroom that's kind of like this walk-in closet. The, the listener can't see it, but this, this walk-in closet is just more turned into a... Uh, a man cave slash office or a person cave slash office. Um, And now I, I do have a bit of like work life separation, but obviously that's only by a few feet. Um, So I'm kind of surprised at how quickly me and my team have been able to jump in. But what for you um, are your team members there? There seems like they're not acclimating as well. Yeah, I think it's like more so they're not used to it. So then it's just like, oh, I think everything will be easier if we jump on a Zoom call. But like in reality, I feel like the Zoom calls take up more time than if you just explained it in a Slack message or an email. But I think that's also how I personally work is just like, tell me what the problem is. Here are the solutions I can offer. And then let's go from there. We don't need to go around in circles and discuss it for an hour and that's like with every meeting that we have on Zoom. Um, but I, I think it's just like a personal preference with work because I uh, also I hate meetings in <laughs> in a normal setting too. Every meeting could have been an email, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I'm actually the other way. I like interpersonal communication just because mm-hmm. I feel like I can uh, I can understand a little bit more, and also I can kind of Im- impress upon whoever I'm talking to a bit more of my POV, so I can you know, help gain more control over a situation, but that's me. Uh, And I, I write less emails now, but by virtue of, of wanting to write less emails, you know? Yeah. I think I want a communication thing. For me, if it's because I view it as a survival job that I'm like, this is like, let me just do the thing that I need to do so I can get to, the actual creative career that I want to cultivate. I think it's just like the balance of like being an artist and being in this office survival mode. (laughs) Yes. No, totally. Um, How's Um, everything with the podcast? So the podcast, well, I was recording for season three. I recorded a couple of episodes and then the pandemic struck and I was very upset and sad. Um, And Maybe I'll do it on Zoom, but I think the biggest heartbreak for me was actually uh, the pilot going on halt because we were set for production in June um, and we were like almost there, you know, everything pre-production was like going at a steady pace and then all of a sudden everything closed down. Um, And I don't know if your listeners know or if you know, Rich, um, but the pilot is set on a college campus. So Obviously, all colleges across America, if they're being responsible, they are closed now. So right. there's no way we could film. Um, and there's also no way we could film now with social distancing because we would be less than six feet apart if we were filming. Right, right. And then you, uh, that was a pilot that you had created, ideated upon. And, I, and uh, had you raised all the funds? It seems like you had raised all the funds. You were ready to go, right? Yeah, we had raised all the funds. Um, We're, you know, in talks with other investors outside of Kickstarter because Kickstarter does take a percentage for people who are interested in Kickstarting. Just letting you know, they take 8% if people pay by credit card. And that's a huge chunk when it comes to production. Um, Yeah, so we were ready to go with with everything. But yeah, the college closures, social distancing, all put it into a halt, which is 
nor which is the norm for everyone in the industry right now in the entertainment industry right now i think the only production that kept on going was my 600 pound life um because that made the news that they were still filming secretly huh secretly (laughs) we're not so secretly what channel is that on i think it's on tlc i want to say wow is that where 90 day fiance is on too Probably just any of those like reality TV shows. But I think the reason I know about reality TV, (laughs) I love reality. Oh, that's right. I love the Jersey Shore. (laughs) Yeah, you do. Um, But even then, I was like kind of like bummed out because there are new episodes of Jersey Shore Family Vacation. Yes, there are. Yeah, but free the stitch. He's free. Yes. But even then, I was just like, I can't get into it because, like, it's not the same anymore. I think quarantine has changed my perspective. I was thinking that, too. Like, when I now when I watch TV or when I watch media now, it's hard to think of it not in the terms of BC and AC before Corona and after coronavirus or before COVID, after COVID. I'm whenever I. I consume something now, I think, wow, that's so quaint, not having to deal with a pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Because their problems, if we're talking about the Jersey Shore, is like nothing in comparison (laughs) to what we are going through now. Right, exactly. So even then, maybe Jersey Shore has run its course in my mind. One of my shows. I love trash. (laughs) I I wonder what the first piece of media is going to be that actually deals with it within like a narrative, but not like in a reality show narrative or not even in like the, the film version of whatever this is. I'm thinking like, like what's the first sitcom that's going to be the first situation comedy that's going to be like, Oh yeah. Post coronavirus or post this because, because this is not unlike, or I guess after nine 11, it took a while for that to creep into comedic vernacular right right yeah uh it's interesting you bring that up because a few days ago it was on npr or probably like deadline or some of one of these industry news reports that the producers of the office were thinking about creating a show about remote working based on this covid19 era right um and i took a quick glance at all the comments and everyone was like no i don't want this please don't do this it's like too soon to you know, make this a funny show right. because it's like, it's taking away from the fact that at least how I interpreted, it's taking away from the fact that, you know, there are real consequences to this. Um, it's not just privileged people, you know, stuck at home working from a computer, their, you know, lives at stake and real people who are essential workers who are putting their lives on the lines as well. So I think, I hope they rethink it because I think it might be too soon. I think it's going to take a while for it to be funny. Yeah. I think we need a collective grieving process before we can move on to that space. That's a great uh, segue because for content, right? Because I think it's important to have content as escapism, Mm -hmm. especially during this time because we're we're all at home and whether um, whether you're well or sick or you know someone that's sick, I think right now we all know someone that's affected by this physically um, from a health perspective, but um, literally we are all affected by it. And I think it's important to find things to do. What, what, what is that fine line? I'm, I'm more just, I'm more just asking and, and probing out of curiosity for you. What do you think that fine line is? Um, I don't, I mean, it's hard, right? Because like, even now it's still taboo to, I mean, no, I've definitely heard Holocaust jokes before, but I feel like, I don't know. It's, there's still a taboo attached to it because it was horrific. Um, And I know that there is a need for escapism, but I think at the same time, in order to move on effectively and move on, like with our psyche as a nation, because I think we also need that. I think we really do need to sit with this discomfort for a little bit and sit with the reality of the situation Um, because I think our culture tends to value escapism more than, more than processing. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, And I don't know if that's like a hyper individualistic culture that we have, or if it's because I feel like in 
how Asia tackled the situation, for example, there was like this collectivism involved and that is the culture of Asia is very much like, let's work together to get through this. But even now, for example, I step outside to get groceries and people are still like not wearing masks and like standing way too close to me and giving me a panic attack. Right. <laughs> um, and treating this like it's nothing. Like even last week, I saw pictures of people in Williamsburg just picnicking out in Domino Park. I'm like, why are you doing that? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, Williamsburgers? Come on. Yes. And Prospect Park. Come on. I see you, Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even uh, left my house if not to just get supplies. That's the only thing I do now. I, I, I haven't left my my block and a half radius in 30 days. Yeah, it's scary to go out there. It is scary. I'm scared. And then I do have my, my homemade mask that one of my designers at work has been making them. So it's made out of muslin and that's really cool. So, and I also have gloves. I'm just letting, I'm just going down the list of my protocol. And then uh, we wiped down all of our groceries. And the only times when I will extend past my block and a half, because also we go to a local uh, bodega, like a Korean owned bodega, because um, I just to support a local business. Um, but also I think that the current wave of, of Asian bigotry and xenophobia has led less people into that uh, bodega, right? Yeah, into that so into that little store. Now I I want to support them to financially and also just kind of like, you know, just be there because uh, I'm sure that they're feeling some type of way too. But the only time that I extend past my, my block and a half is if I go running, but it'll be at like six in the morning when no one's on the street. Yeah, same. You know? um, I'm not a runner and I've decided to take up running. I'm horrible at it. And then I kind of zigzag across people. Like if as soon as I see a person in a distance, I'll go to the other side. It's like zombies, just like running from them. What is your, uh, what is your take on, on that Asian xenophobia wave? The bigotry Oof. wave. Have you have you experienced anything within within your time? I've I've heard of attacks in Brooklyn. I've heard of of uh, people like overly yelling slurs in the street. Everything is just like very much out there. And also, obviously, there's little ability to defend oneself in the current ecosystem. So, I just want to get your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, well, that was part of my. Uh, insane laughing crying episodes in early March or late March whenever this happened um, was because of all of these attacks on Asian Americans and Asians um, and I don't know I like go through so many emotions about this because you know just last night I read an article that someone attacked an Asian woman in Brooklyn it was like waiting outside of her home and attacked her with acid. I heard this. And I was just like, I would not survive that. That's horrible. And so scary. Cause when you think about acid attacks, you kind of think like, Oh, that happens in a distant land somewhere where like things are not okay. There it's war torn. Of course there's acid attacks, but you never see it here. I would imagine like it's never really in the news. Um, it's really scary. It definitely makes me want to stay in more. And I do get a lot of anxiety when I step out. Um, it's interesting that you're going through your protocols of gloves and masks. I also wear gloves, masks, and I always wear like a beanie or something that like just covers my features if I'm out alone, because yeah. I don't want to even take that risk of someone seeing me, seeing an Asian woman in the distance and like getting that opportunity to attack me or yell at me because it's just, it's just so much to deal with. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I have never felt that type of fear before, but now I do get that anxiety. It's like a new feeling. Yeah. Um, I will say when I was a kid, I definitely, I didn't feel it like strongly. It was just like every so often there would be random slurs but it's also Riverside at the time. Riverside wasn't that diverse. Um, but yeah, I will say this is a newfound fear of feeling unsafe, just existing as an Asian person. Um, but I, I also want to say that I hope this brings the Asian American community together to, you know, have a dialogue about sol solidarity with other people of color and communities of color 
because I do feel like historically Asian Americans um, and just like the black and brown community have been pitted against each other. And Asian Americans are almost more white adjacent. I mean, it's very clear, for example, with Andrew Yang and his recent horrible op-ed saying that we should just prove that we're American and we're more American. And it's just ridiculous because that's not going to get us anywhere because at the end of the day, white people look at us and think we're chinks basically. Right. Right. <laughs> not to... Because obviously you, we look different. Yes, you exactly. Can't, I think that's something that Andrew Yang didn't quite communicate is you'll never overcome the actual physical difference of an Asian person from anyone else. Right. Exactly. And you know, to acknowledge that's that part the rhetoric, too. that's the rhetoric that um, when Japanese Americans were in, were sent to internment camps, that was the rhetoric too. Of before that, they were just like, let's prove our Americanness and patriotism and join the military and things like that. But that's not enough. History has shown us that that is not enough. Like we need to start standing in solidarity with other communities of color because clearly white supremacy will always find a scapegoat to blame this on even if China and other Asian countries have actually had this under control and the West is actually out of control with the pandemic. Right. I think it's a myth of assimilation. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I think exactly. assimilation just, it never quite equals what you think it's going to equal. It never quite turns out the way you think it's going to turn out. So um, I, I think that whenever groups um, actually become I don't know. When you have like a true melting pot kind of mentality, I think that happens much more organically, <laughs> like yeah. like New York City in and of itself by virtue of like travel and and necessary communication and, you know, financial exchange. It's not because someone's going to write an op-ed piece. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I am, I will say this has made me really disappointed in New York um, just because there was so many, at least the ones I've seen, a lot of the attacks have been in New York. Um, I actually haven't really heard about it anywhere else, obviously in LA too. Um, but I just, I don't know. I was, I know that there are, there are segregation problems within New York, but I just thought because it's such an international city and so diverse that maybe we would have moved past that and learned from our mistakes from nine 11 and, you know, targeting Muslim Americans. Do you think that that's because... <laughs> Do you think that that's because New York has the highest amount of infections right now in the country? Because you are the epicenter now. That's true. But I feel like I was hearing about these, this rise in Asian American hate crimes even before we became the epicenter. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that was right. especially when, when it was the Chinese virus. Right. Right. Um, which is a terrible, horrible thing. So. Yeah. And obviously... Uh, Trump does not make it better and just fuels all of this hate and all these attacks. And I'm also really sad today because my love Bernie Sanders dropped out of the race. Oh yeah. There we go. (laughs) There we go. Double whammy, triple whammy. Yeah. So it's been, it's been horrible. It's been a horrible timeline to live in. 2020 sucks. Yeah. It's bad. I it's thought really 2016 bad. was bad, but this is bad. <laughs> oh, man. We're, there's definitely an alternate timeline or an alternate universe where Trump didn't get elected and also this didn't happen. So I want to find that alternate self. <laughs> yeah, it's time. I'm over it. It's time to travel through space and time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as we're wrapping up, uh, let's end on something positive. I'd love to know after we get through this and then we can walk in the streets again, safely, hopefully. Uh, what are the things that you're looking forward to? What do you want to do once we're out of the quarantine? This is a good one. I feel like I I really want to hug my friends and family. I feel like I'm just going to start ugly crying immediately. I don't even remember what that feeling is like um, to not be scared of another human being that's not, you know, my fiance. Um Yeah, I would love to do that. I honestly, I would, I want to sit in a Chinese restaurant or any Asian restaurant at this point and just, just hear people and be among people because that's, that's something I miss as well. Maybe go to a rooftop bar. I don't even like rooftop bars, but I'll go. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you'll, you'll do a tour of all rooftop bars. Exactly. Just to like be among people and like have that energy again. Cause this cool. is, this is bad. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty horrible, but you know, what has been great talking to you, Sandy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, where can our listeners find you, hear you? Oh, wow. Um, so you can find me on my Instagram, even though I'm not really on it anymore, but it's Sandy Pants, S-A-N-D-I-E Pants, P-A-N-T-S-S. And on Twitter, Sandy Pants as well, but without the extra S in the end. And you can also listen to Now in Color anywhere you get podcasts as well. Um, hopefully season three will be up and running after this pandemic is over. Um, I might have to do some Zoom sessions uh, before then. And also you can find more about my pilot, Imposters, on Instagram at Imposters Show. Um, we're hoping to go into production maybe in the fall. <laughs> so check us out. Dope. Sandy, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can find the First Generation Burden podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever you get podcast content. On social media, you can find us at at First Gen Burden, and you can find me at Rich underscore TU on various social media. If possible, please support your frontline healthcare workers by donating to First Responders First at help.firstrespondersfirst.co. Check this feed for more episodes. I hope you stay safe and stay healthy.